All right, so here we are um, on another episode of World of Hustle. I'm here with one of my um, former colleagues, friend, um, currently the executive director of the USHBA, the U.S. Hemp Building Association, Mr. Jacob Waddell. Jake, thanks for coming on, brother. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Ryan. It's good to see you. Good to see you, man. Um, today, Jake, we're going to talk a little bit about the USHBA and what it is that the wonderful work you guys are doing over there, some of uh, your very recent exciting accomplishments. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll talk to him a little bit about you and a little bit about hemp and just other things too. Um, and so let's, uh, let's first start out by just giving, giving the audience an idea of what the USHBA is, is all about. So the U.S. Hemp Building Association is set up to try to drive the hemp building industry forward in the United States. Mm -hmm. This is an industry that we've seen succeed and thrive in Europe and UK, Canada, and we know it's coming to this country. And right now it's we are trying to set up the foundation for which it will grow off of and um, help accelerate it as fast as possible. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, and so... As we kind of, as we kind of um, take that in, how, as as people that are obviously not in the construction industry or not in, you know, not really aware so much of that industry, why is it important that they're aware of the work that you guys are doing? So there are many things that we're dealing with right now as a society. Um, you know, environmental issues, health issues, um, things that can be affected and are affected by the buildings we live in and we work in. Mm -hmm. So when we look at ways to make positive impacts on the climate, we have to take into account the building industry. Right now, the building industry um, makes up 35 to 40% of the carbon footprint of the world. Um, about 11% of that is the building materials, the rest of the operations of the building. Mm -hmm. That primarily is electricity going to your heating and ventilation systems. Mm -hmm. So we have an option of material here that is technically carbon negative when you put it in the wall. Basically, this plant absorbs a lot of carbon as it grows, and then we take this plant and we mix it in with stone. Mm -hmm. So just to elaborate a little bit on that, um, hemp can be used in a lot of different materials in the building industry. There are things like hemp wood and hemp bad insulation, which are basically direct corollaries to other products on the market. But one product that doesn't really have that same connection is what's called hemp lime or hemp creep. This is a potential building material um, that creates a, basically the wall system and the insulation related to it in the building. Uh, it's a mixture of hemp lime as a binder and water um, and then you mix these things together and pack them together into a solid structure solid wall mm -hmm. and it kind of re it takes care of all the things that normally are in your wall system mm -hmm. um, it's insulative it's because of the lime it's fireproof because of the lime and the fact that it's vapor open it prevents mold from growing um, so all these things that are critical issues in our current living situation are uh, improved or benefited from. Um, when we look at buildings in general, uh, this is an older type of technology. This is something that was done hundreds of years ago. Um, and we there's examples re ranging back all the way to the Roman era. Now, when you look at it back in those time periods, they weren't focusing on hemp, but it, the idea of using agricultural crops as an aggregate into lime to make a construction material yeah. was widely used. Gotcha. And really the differences and the changes in our structure of buildings really came in the advent of plastics and really the heating and ventilation systems took us to a step where we were creating sealed boxes and then depending on these mechanical systems to pump air in and out. This system harks to a previous time where the wall systems were actually vapor open and things pass through them and now you have a mass wall like this wall structure that holds heat and prevents you know dissipation of heat and energy mm -hmm. and can keep things within a building better so there, there's there's lots of aspects um, 
that make this different than our current building practices. Yeah. So that's that's a big hurdle for us is to try to open it up to the industry. Gotcha. Um, and so just again going back to the the everyday person that's really not as familiar with this, you know, we're moving towards in every aspect of society towards healthier, more green, um, eco friendly sort of thing. And so it, it sounds like what's going to happen down the road is look, you don't know about this today. It's coming to you. You're going to know about it at some point. Um, it's a, it's a healthier living situation worldwide, cutting down on those carbon emissions, as you said. Um, but it sounds like in there somewhere you were saying that like it, you could eventually have your, your house built with, uh, hemp insulation or, or what have you. And it's just a healthier living situation, um, for the individual, right? Absolutely. So yeah. you don't have the, the same petrochemicals. Mm -hmm. Basically what we're doing right now is you put a water resistant barrier or sealed thing around your framing. And then on the inside, we put a bunch of things that have VOCs and petrochemicals often to protect them from burning and to create like insulation, like for instance, uh, spray and foam. Uh, but these can have very adverse effects on people's health. Yeah. And often we're being basically like micro dosed. So we don't like see the impact. It just has an overall effect Got over time. Gotcha. Yeah. Wow. Um, that's crazy. And I mean, when you think about, don't quote me, but I think we have like some, some, uh, crazy cancer rates in this country. Uh, and I'm not saying, I'm not saying that it's, I have any evidence to support this, but it would be tough to say. Um, that the microdosing, as you mentioned, couldn't be a factor in that. So it could, it could definitely just overall health wise, you, it sounds like it's going to be a better situation. Right. So especially when you talk about things like affordable housing, uh -huh. basically affordable housing, we're creating cheap buildings using the cheapest building materials that are the least healthy. And we are seeing long-term effects on people that live in affordable housing. Now, so this has made them more susceptible, like for instance, when COVID came through of sickness like that, you know, it's more susceptible to diabetes. Now, part of this has to do with diet as well, yeah. but their living environment, basically they're trapped in a place where they're just absorbing chemicals. Wow. And so if we can move to healthier building materials, mm -hmm. then we can prevent these issues, like issues we don't, we're not even aware of because again, it's like a little bit at a time. So and so. how do you put a finger on it? Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, that's, that's crazy, man. So that's definitely something to think about. So with that said, before we go any further, um, anybody that wants to, th this is something I think everybody needs to know about. Um, I think it's something that people should contribute to. Okay. If people want to contribute to the USHBA, how can they do so, Jake? Okay, so the easiest way is to go to ushba.org. Um, there will be a button on there to donate to the U.S. Hemp Building Foundation. Now, I'll, I'm just going to explain that a little bit. Mm -hmm. The USHBA is a 501c6 membership-based organization that's really advocates and companies in the industry that you know pay a membership fee, and we're working in committees and work groups to get things done in the industry to move it forward. Mm -hmm. The U.S. Hemp Building Foundation is a 501c3, which makes it a charitable organization and which you can get tax deductible donations submitted to the organization. And we can use that money to drive forward the initiatives coming through the brain of the USHBA, if you will. Gotcha. So the most recent one um, and the biggest thing, the biggest news we have right now has to do with the International Residential Code. Um, do, you, do you want me to kind of go into Yeah, that? let's talk about that. Okay, so um, the big news right now is about a week ago, last Saturday, um, we got recommended for a brief approval of the appendix we submitted to the International Residential Code. Now, I'm going to explain codes to you as simply as I can. Basically, in this country, they are uh, splintered. Every state can have their own codes. Every county can have their own codes like that they accept and move around. It almost is like the permitting officer you're dealing with does have a level of judgment mm -hmm. that can decide whether you can do something or not. Now, what we've submitted is what's called a model code. Now, International Residential Code is really American codes and a couple other countries that accept the codes that we are recommending. Mm -hmm. um, and that is going through the acceptance process, which means that it'll be accepted in their model code. Now, the next step is actually get adoption in different states and counties. But once we do that, then the building officer, the permitting officer can allow these buildings without having to do anything else. Right now, there's a large process called a material variance 
Um, uh, basically, if you can show that the material you're using is performing as good or better than the other accepted materials, then you can use that material. But that's a, like a three month, four month, five month process. It delays you know, your production or creating your house. Um, so these things are things we've done so far, but we're trying to get past that point so that they know it's an accepted material, they know what they're dealing with, and we don't have to deal with those delays. Mm-hmm. Our goal is to get to the point where we have entire subdivisions built of this stuff, where we're making thousands and thousands and thousands of homes. And when you talk about big business like that, they can't be worried about these little delays and things. So we have to find a way to eliminate that. And that's a lot of what we're doing is trying to do that. So the good news is we got accept, recommended for acceptance. In October, we'll probably be accepted. If we can start getting these things adopted, we've made a giant step forward into having this be a common thing that anyone can use in their home. That's awesome. Um, so if it does get accepted in October, then we can pretty much move forward. So let's say, let's say that it does, where do you see this? Where do you see us in like, let's say five years? So there's a couple steps in development that we have to go through still. Mm -hmm. Now we we're kind of opening up the gates of this is an acceptable thing. This is a known entity. After we get past that point, we are talking about a material that has not gone through the level of industrialization we've seen with other building materials over the last 60, 70 or more years because it was not an allowable material mm-hmm. because of the prohibition of, of hemp or, or uh, cannabis. Yeah. Um, so now we need to make companies feel okay to spend their R&D money and their budgets to figure out how to make this material better and improve. Once we start seeing that happen, we will see the performance capabilities of this material jump because all that all that science that has gone into concrete over the last decades and all that science that has gone into improving wood and all, all this science that has been used on other building materials can be reapplied to this material and then we will see it be a lot more competitive in the market. And at that point, I think we'll start seeing it more and more places. Yeah. Uh, what we've seen in, in Europe is starting slow and then accelerating and accelerating. When we talk about places like France, we're talking about thousands and thousands of buildings. They're doing construction um, on a commercial level. They're doing residential. Um, so there, there's very likely a high potential because of our market and the way it's set up that we'll even see a larger growth rate. Wow. So, um, tell, tell me if I'm, if I'm onto something here, it sounds like this is going to be a situation where once it really takes a hold and once it get, really gets to rolling, things are going to develop really quickly. That's the hope. And okay. so what we're doing right now is we're trying to set the foundation to allow that by having basically rules and things people need to hit for performance wise to make sure it's a safe material. Mm-hmm. We're trying to prevent mistakes happening. And we're, we're working also like right now on standards and our supply chain. So we're setting up like the test methods. Currently we have a test method that was written up by myself and a couple of my colleagues uh, on how you measure hemp herd. And that's going through ASTM right now. And we're, we're in the, the st- uh, testing phase right now to get the precision data. Mm-hmm. But that means hopefully in the next couple months, we'll be able to put it to ballot. And if we get that approved, suddenly we'll know the tests we need to run to say, coming out of this processor, this is the material you're getting. Right now, we don't even have those basics set up. And you know, we both come from, uh, our experience together is, is the automotive industry. Yeah. And automotive industry, quality is key. And it's like, if you don't have quality standards and can't show that you're creating a consistent product, yeah. you're in trouble. Yeah. And so we need to get those foundations set up. Gotcha. Gotcha, man. Um, well, it sounds like sounds like good. A lot of good progress has been made, but there's still some still some way to go. Um, excited to see how that develops. Yeah, um, absolutely. And that that is the exciting thing here. Is as much as this is a great thing, and I, I love hemp building. Mm-hmm. We're talking about the creation of an industry that is such there's such high potential. I mean, we could do anything. Yeah. And so it's like trying to like plan and, and figure out where those pieces go. This is, it's like entrepreneurs. This is the exciting part. This is like where you get to use your imagination and say, 
all right, where is this thing, that key that will take us that next leap forward and trying to determine what that is. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, hmm. That's good stuff. Well, again, uh, thanks for, thanks for that, Jake. And, um, just going back guys, this is, this is an awesome, uh, thing to be a part of. It's, it's something that, um, I think everybody needs to be aware is, is going on. It's coming to us. As you said, it's in Europe, it's, it's everyday thing. Um, so it's, it's definitely coming. Um, please, you know, go out, uh, contribute, contribute to this. Um, Jake just told you where you guys can contribute. We'll have a, we'll have a link to it. Um, I do want to say you need to confirm with your, uh, your, your local tax professional, but, um, you know, you guys can donate up to, uh, I do every year, you can donate up to 300, 300 bucks a year, still get your, uh, standard deduction. So it helps you, um, to give back. And at the same time, you get you a deduction on your taxes. Uh, like I said, confirm with your, your local CPA, but, um, definitely something worth, worth, uh, contributing to. Um, so thanks for that, Jake. There's, there's some other things, um, that I'd like to talk to you about just in terms of like your background and everything. We kind of went reverse today, um, just because I really wanted to, to get that stuff out there for listeners on the front end. But I want to talk a little bit about your, your background, Jake. I know, um, I don't think we said it before, but you're, you're an engineer. Um, sorry about that. I want to, I just want to talk about how you kind of, you know, you, you got involved with this. Um, and talk a little bit about a little bit about your background. Sorry, I'm taking my computers. Dude, it always does this. It tries to go to sleep on me. Um, so as you mentioned before, we 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 met each other in the automotive industry. Um, you were working as an engineer. I was working in finance. Um, and so you, as we as we talked about before this, your engineering background has helped you out a lot with with your work with the uh, with the US HVA. Um, can you just can you just give us a little bit of uh, background information on on you? Yeah, um, I'm, I'll give you the the sh- short long story. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, grew up different places, but went to school for material science and engineering. Mm-hmm. Um, then went to grad school up in at, well, as a University of Florida. Then went up to Georgia Tech mm-hmm. for and got my master's there. Um, master's in what now? A material science and engineering material science. with a focus on composites. Okay. Um, and then, I mean, honestly, I, I took a journey from there. I like, I worked in a testing lab and then I went and traveled Europe and I came back and tried to be a musician. And then I, uh, get, became an engineer working, making fuel tanks for boats. And then that's, then I went and joined Molly and, yeah. you know, started as an industrial engineer, ended up program management and, and all this stuff. Got my MBA while I was there. Um, so I guess there, there's two aspects to what I do and what, what I'm good at. Um, part of it is engineering and part of it's management and both those things are actually pretty interconnected you know as as a scientist i know that i need to keep asking why i need to keep developing i need to keep moving forward i need to keep looking at how things are affected by new inputs and as management i had to learn people and like how these same things about influences and trying new tactics and I guess coming from automotive continuously improving the situation and and figuring things out became very important um so in this role in particular uh the engineering background has had me realize to take things back to a base level that you know we need measurables we need you know data we need this sort of things to move forward so that's why my focus as I've been in leadership of the USA Hemp Building Association has been, we got to get codes figured out. We got to get standards set up for quality control. Because to me, as an engineer, these are essential to really move this forward. If right. we can't get the basics down, then it, you know, we are bound to make mistakes because we're going to be not knowing exactly what we're doing because we can't measure it and repeat it. So that became extent, uh, very important. Um, also, I think... The, the fact that I always try to ask why um, is kind of essential to how I do management. Uh, I, I don't know. We, we talked a little bit about this, I guess, before. But um, in management, what I learned is people are important. I have seen a lot of things fail because they did not 
people at a high level did not respect and understand what people at the very bottom level that were actually doing things were doing. And that by understanding people and connecting to them and communicating from them, that's how you find out how to actually fix things and move things forward. Mm -hmm. On top of that, when I was in my MBA, the thing that I took away probably the most was how to get morale and the, the concept of justice. And like, mm -hmm. really, justice can break down to you listening to people and you hearing people. And the truth is, as an engineer or a scientist, I want all the information I can get. So even if I don't agree with somebody, mm -hmm. I want to hear what they have to say because there's going to be an ounce of truth in there. And that ounce of truth is going to make the picture clearer and make us make better decisions. Yeah. And so listening to people is a big deal. Explaining to people if they have questions, like explaining why you made a decision. Because I'm a human being. I'm going to make mistakes. We're all going to make mistakes. But right now, I am making the decision based on the information I have mm -hmm. and trusting that's the best decision I can make. Now, I might get more information in the future, and I might realize that decision was wrong. But right now, I'm going to make the decision on the, the information I have and try to do what's right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so just, just kind of to recap, I think that's a powerful lesson for anybody out there that's in leadership. Because I've, I've seen that too where, and it sounds like you're saying, correct me if I'm wrong, if you're, if you're in a leadership position, it's so critical that you understand those people. You really understand those people that you're overseeing and understand what their aches and pains are you can't just be, you know, because you are up here and you think you know what's going on. You can't just be passing down orders without really getting down there with those people that are doing it every day and kind of feeling feeling that out. Um, yeah, I think that's powerful. Yeah, that's good. Oh, oh, yeah. Um, oh, awesome. Um, so yeah, I I I hear you, Jake. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, that, that's that's absolutely right. Yeah. You have to hear what people have to say, and you know what? If you listen to people, they'll their morale is going to be higher. They're going to take ownership of what they're doing, and they're going to execute better. Yeah. And that is the key. Like management, leadership, and everything is getting the best out of your people. Yeah. And so if you could show them respect, they'll respect you, and they'll do things for you because you respect them. And sadly, we live in a world where a lot of people don't respect each other. And so when people see that respect, they will respond. Um, would you call that creating buy-in? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I have to say, man, the people that I have, uh, the people that I have worked for, that I've worked the hardest for, they're the ones I feel like they respect me. The ones I feel like they're listening to what I'm saying, um, yeah, I feel heard, you know? Uh, so yeah, that's definitely powerful. Um, and you, you also said, you know, you're going out there, you're, you're proactively trying to let people know, Hey, I'm open to question. Like I, I want your, I want to have a conversation with you. I want to get all the facts. You're, um, you know, you pointed out Warren Buffett earlier. Um, you know, one of the things that he says is he doesn't really care about being right or wrong. He just wants to know what the facts are. And you get that from going out and having a conversation with people to move your organization forward. Absolutely. And like, so we, we just, we just got a new board on and our mm -hmm. organization and I'm so happy that like, I see both sides of an argument. I see, we have, you know, red and blue people in the, in the room. Mm -hmm. We have people that, that may have hard feelings about a topic, but it seems like we have people on both sides mm -hmm. and those are the type of rooms that get progress. And those are the type of rooms that get us moving forward. Mm -hmm. As soon as we start, going to a place where we're around yes men and like echo chambers, we stop growing and we start getting better. Yeah. Okay. That goes back to another concept I've heard about. It's been a while um, since it's come up for me, but it it's, you talk about yes men. Um, that's not a good thing. It sounds like we want to create a situation where it's, you know, we, we don't want useless or, or argue, arguing where we're bringing each other down, but we want to, um, it's fine for people to be passionate and, and heated about what they feel. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a constructive arguing. It's trying to get the best. You know, nobody's like has an agenda or is trying to push any certain thing. They just really want the best. And it's great when they're both on two different sides of the, the fence because it gives you, it gives you a full... Um, 
it gives you a full view of everything that's going on. Um, yeah, I, I feel like in, in my professional career, I want to, I don't, you know, sometimes I think when we, when we think about arguing or um, just having a, a banner back and forth about a topic, it gets like a negative con- connotation, but it can actually be a really positive thing. Like we can, we can really get something from that. Um, I think the thing that would probably be good, and you, and you tell me what you think, is um, as you go into that and knowing that you have the strong feelings about how we should do this thing or how this thing should flow, be open to, um, like for me, I try to be, I want people to prove me wrong. I want people to um, tell me where are the holes in what I'm saying. I love running into people that are like super passionate about what they feel about things because they're going to have thought through their whole side of it. And so when we have a conversation, they're telling me the whole piece that I could, I probably never really could even see. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. And th- but this kind of goes back to like the whole being heard thing mm-hmm. is that works, but it only works if both sides are listening. Yeah. If you're not listening and you're just there to talk about your side of things, it's not going to be productive. But if people are listening on both sides, yeah. then yes, then the conversation evolves and you start thinking together and then you get somewhere better. And like when you talk about groups of people, when you have both sides of that argument in the leadership and both sides represented in the leadership, then those people outside the leadership say, hey, I'm represented in there as well because my opinions follow person A or person B. So it also makes the greater group feel heard. Yeah. So it, it's, it's a very complicated puzzle because you do naturally breed some level of conflict this way, mm-hmm. but you create constructive conflict as long as everybody's listening. That's the key word, constructive conflict. I don't <laughs> think I said it, but that, that's the word I was searching for, constructive conflict. We need it so badly in organizations. Um, do you... I don't want to go too far off topic, but I've, I've heard another guy that I'm really, I really admired named uh, Ray Dalio. And he talks about, um, uh, have you been in an organization where there was like a lot of bureaucracy and like politics and stuff like that? Yes. I mean, that's unavoidable. Unavoidable. Yeah. He said, he said like the greatest detriment to organizations is like, is that, you know, it's, it just, te- it tears it down. It, it, it does not create constructive conflict and it makes hard for organizations to move forward. Um, so anyway, I thought I'd yeah, put it out there. yeah, bureaucracy can prevent communication in a lot of ways. Yeah. Okay. Um, anyway, kind of random. Just one out there. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> we'll cut it out, dude. Um, but uh, so again, you're you're working um, it, as you said before. It's a nonprofit. Um, everything that you've kind of learned up to this point has been extremely helpful in helping you navigate in this, uh, in this space. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you is just in this, in this whole environment before, before we, before we got started, you were kind of telling me about, um, I mean, you, you've been instrumental in, in developing and develop you and your team have been instrumental in developing the USAPA and it's, there's never like, again correct me if i'm wrong but it hasn't been like super clear cut on which direction to go like you guys have to figure it out yourself right it's not yes yeah Yeah, absolutely um i'm gonna being very clear here i don't have some grand plan i never have a big picture i see like targets and goals and the things that make sense Mm -hmm. immediately Mm -hmm. i can prioritize that way i can do risk management but when people try to set a picture way out there and say, all right, I'm going to draw the plan here. And then it's dependent on this happening, this happening, this happening, this happening. Once you go a couple steps deep, it, the likelihood of it actually working out like that falls drastically. Yeah. So it's much better for you to like go, okay, this is the next step. And maybe this is two or three steps ahead. But after that, I'm going to adapt to what happens because things are going to happen whether it be personnel fallout, whether it be law changes, things will happen and you're going to have to adapt. Mm -hmm. So by not overburdening yourself with expectations of what will happen in the future, you can make better decisions now. And you can make things like decisions that you know, no matter what happens, this will be good. Like, you know, productive.
There we go. <laughs> Sorry, Jake. <laughs> uh, okay, man. So you were saying that I, I feel like you, you what you're saying is it's the importance of being flexible and not getting too attached to like, I have to do this one thing. There's a quote by Mike Tyson. He says, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. You heard that? Yes. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, going back to what you said, like, I, 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 I mean, you know more than I do, but um, I really do believe that that's true. Like, you have to understand things can change. Um, and it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't undermine the value of planning. Um, it's just, it just you, you, can't, you can't get tied to things. You have to understand that things are going to change, like you said. Um, you have to be flexible. Um, yeah. And so it's, um, it's just, I, I think some, some people, what, what could happen to them, they could be potentially tempted to get demotivated because, you know, they said, Oh, I'm going to set out and do these 10 steps and I'm doing in this exact order. I know I used to be really like this just in my personal life. And like, if one thing got messed up and I was like, I'm just going to quit for the day and you, you can't do that. Right. Right. So you, you kind of have two sides of it. One is like the analysis paralysis. So you, you sit there and you make a plan and you, you take months to make a plan and basically suddenly something happens and that plan has to change. And so would it have been better to start moving forward weeks before, you know, on a looser plan? And so things are going to change anyway and you can adapt to it. And the other is right. It can actually be demoralizing. If you set plans and you set goals and you say this is going to happen and this is going to happen and it doesn't, that's reality. That's the world. We live in a chaotic place. You got to be okay with that. And the more you're open to adaptation, the more you learn your own ability to figure things out on the fly, the better you'll be. And um, as a like going back to the whole science thing, the, the thing I always say is, like as a scientist, as soon as you think you know everything and you stop asking why. You stop being a real scientist. Mm. You know, you have to be ready to move and shift. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hmm. I would say, I mean, I, obviously you're a scientist and, and you're saying that's critical to your field, but I think, I think everybody should be, um, should kind of think like that. I, I do. Um, okay, Jake, there's another thing we talked about before we started and it's, um, it's, it's the four eyes that yeah. you mentioned. I, I, I want to talk about that. I want to preface it a little bit and say that, because I thought it was really impressive, um, and I think it's going to be something that's really useful for the audience, particularly, it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, you're going to get involved um, with, with a venture like what you're doing, because uh, you mentioned you, you've done it with, if you're trying to get involved with music or, or whatever it is, um, it's a, it's a, really effective way to go and make the impact and do what it is that you want to do. So can you tell us about the four eyes? Yeah. So, um, again, th this, this is kind of sticking with the idea of being adaptable and loose as you move forward and figuring things out. So this is a process I learned and the, the time I can say I first used it was when I was getting involved in the local music scene here in Nashville. Mm -hmm. Um, so the first thing you need to do, is you need to investigate whatever you want to do. You need to look at it, try to see who the players are, try to see you know what the environment is, and if you really want to be there. And then once you investigate and you go, yes, this is something I want to do, these are the people, you start infiltrating. And I know that kind of can have a bad connotation, but it is just getting to know the people, the players, getting to know who you want to work with, finding out the good people from the not so good people, and finding your your place uh, once you can get there and you start growing confidence with the people around you and you start building your community you start influencing it mm -hmm. and so when you start influencing it you know initially it's just going to be like you doing work you proving your value and then people will start taking your value and going okay what can we do how how can we help you make things happen and you start getting an influence and start moving the ball around start making decisions yeah. And then once you get that and you've grown enough confidence, enough reputation, you can really start making a giant impact. Yeah. And then it kind of it's kind of a cycle because at that point, you know, at the same time, you're still investigating and you're still like figuring out what the next moves are. You know, one door often, often leads to another door, leads to another door. 
So it really kind of can affect any part of your life if you're wanting to make a change and really do something yeah. is you look at it, you make sure you know what you're getting into, then you figure out how to get involved. You know, you, you investigate, you infiltrate. Then once you've done that successfully, you will start influencing things. Mm -hmm. And really the whole point is to get to a place where you can really make a positive impact in whatever area you want. Yeah. So just to recap that, guys, it is investigate, infiltrate, influence, and impact. And you can take that anywhere that you're wanting to go and, and be a part of and you want to make changes and, and positively influence that area. So appreciate that, Jake. Um, oh, man, this, is, this has been good. Um, so, so let's, let's, let's stop for a second here and just think, Jake, and we'll, we'll – uh, I think I think in this episode we've captured a lot of good stuff. Um, people know what the U.S. HBA is now. Um, they know where they can go to be uh, to um, help to help with that. Um, USHBA.org, which is up up right now. Um, if you guys want to learn more about uh, the organization and and all the positive things that they're they're doing, and um, it's really interesting. I I was out. I was out. Um, I looked at a uh, Sergey. Right. Mm -hmm. I, was, I got caught up in a video that he's yeah, just talking about the whole process. Man, it's so interesting. Um, and he was saying that he's been like all around the world doing doing this stuff. And so um, it, it does kind of shock me that you're saying that it's it's so prevalent within Europe. Um, and and so obviously it's going to come here. I wonder, I feel like on some, it just depends on what it is. Like some things, it kind of starts here and it goes to other parts of the world. But um, is that? It's, it's all, it all has to do with the legality of hemp. I got gotcha. you. It was legal for them to grow over there. And yeah. so they started using it like in the 80s to repair buildings. And that was really the start of hemp lime and hemp creep yeah. um, as we know it. And so the, the only reason it's been prevented here like people have built houses here there's uh the gnaw house was built in 2009 um, there was a bunch of stuff made in like the late knots early teen like 20 teens mm -hmm. um but at the same time during all that they had to import everything and there was no real possibility of a domestic market mm -hmm. things weren't going to come down in prices and make sense to like really scale up yeah now that it's legal to grow we have a real opportunity and you know farmers want things to sell and we want farmers to do well yep. you can also really stimulate local economies because ideally the the plant is grown within 150 miles of where it's processed that's where the economics basically hit mm -hmm. so really for this industry to take off you need farmers everywhere you need processors everywhere yep. and then that's when you talk about something like that you're really talking about stimulating a local economy yep. and then um that that is the beginning of the beauty of the process yeah um when did it um uh, the re well, first of all let me back up and say yeah. this it's 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 illegal because it's associated or it was illegal here um because it was associated with like marijuana like so i'm not an expert on this and you correct me but from what i understand they're both of member hemp and marijuana are members of the cannabis family right Okay, and so they're but they're distinct from each other. I can explain. Okay, okay. so cannabis mm -hmm. is a plant. Okay, um, the distinction between cannabis and hemp, technically, legally speaking, is the quantity of THC. Gotcha. Now, this is not so. It's it's very confusing because you can <laughs> you can take a plant. Okay, um, the cannabis as a plant can be used for the stock. It can be used for the fibers around the stock. It can be used for the grain and it can be used for the flour. Okay. Um, the way you grow it and the horticulture is very important as well as the cultivar. Now the cultivar difference, we're talking about different strains that were grown and they were grown to, to push different properties of the plant. This is, you know, basic genetics development of any plant, you know, from corn to wheat to, to flowers. Mm 
mm-hmm. is you can, you know, crossbreed and stuff to get certain things out. Yeah. Um, when we talk about things like marijuana, they've crossbred it and they've genetically moved it towards the direction of having high THC levels. When you talk about hemp, what we expect and what we've already started seeing is the development of crops that will have better fiber or better grain output. Mm. And on top of just the cultivars, you have how you plant it that is key and the environmental impact. So um, if you plant them plants far apart, you'll create bushes. This is most desirable for if you want the flower. So this is what you see in CBD grows, and this is what you see in marijuana grows, and really the difference between that type of cannabinoid hemp and marijuana is whatever the legal limit of THC is. So right now it's 0.3%. You know, that might change, but that's what the level is. Now, when you say it's illegal, is that the federal level? Is that what you're talking about? Um, yeah, the federal. Well, no. Um, yes, at the federal level, marijuana is illegal. Yes. Is at it, the state level, it's different for every state. Is it? Okay. Yeah, because you have medical marijuana, mm-hmm. and then you have recreational marijuana, and certain states have medical, certain have recreational. Here in Tennessee, we have none, yeah. so that might be a reason that you don't really know all these little details or minutia. Yeah. Um, but that that's what's kind of separating it. Now, when you talk about grain and fiber, you grow it differently. Mm -hmm. So instead of getting bushes, you want to bring them closer and closer together. So you end up with stalks that don't have space to branch out. So they end up being very vertical and they have some stuff at the top. Um, That is better. That gives you more per yield output for your fiber and for your grain than you would with bushes that are spaced out. Now, when we talk about the end use of the hemp plant, It also depends on your harvest time. So if you want the best, easiest to process fiber, you want to harvest that plant before it flowers. Okay. So at that point, all the energy is going into the growth of the stock and the fiber. So that's where all all your good stuff's going, and that's what you're trying to develop. Now, as soon as those flowers grow, the plant wants to stiffen and strengthen, and it creates more bond between the outside bass fiber and the inner core of the plant Mm -hmm. and this starts to degrade the fiber and make stronger bonds between these two things which make them harder to separate Uh, now all the energy or the primary energy is going to the flower now to get the most desirable flower at that point you need to to stay in that area and just keep all the energy as soon as it seeds all the energy goes to the seed and so if you want grain you want it after it obviously gets fertilized and seeds yeah um so depending on what part of the plant you want, you either want to harvest it before it flowers, before it seeds, or obviously after the grain's made, and then you can take it for grain. Gotcha. So any genetics can technically be used for those different aspects. Mm-hmm. Um, depending on the cultivar, you'll have different properties, but these two things add together to get what your end result is. Mm. Now, as... An initiative and something we're supporting right now is this place called hempexemption.com. What we're looking at is try to get a testing exemption for grain and fiber crops. Because if the end product and the end use has nothing to do with the flower and the THC or the cannabinoids related to it, why should it be tested against that? If we're going to be using a building material, why should that be tested? No one's going to be able to consume that. And the THC level in the stock is not important. Right. Now, this is also critical for us entering into large business. If we talk about things like automotive, which is something that people regularly talk about as a final end product because people like BMW have been doing this in Europe, creating like panels and things like this with hemp as a fiber in the door panel uh, construction. You need to have a low risk product. If there is a risk that the manufacturer of the car part will not have the crop it needs to make its car parts because the THC level went above 0.3% and thus must be destroyed, that's too high of a risk for them to think about that as an asset or a commodity in their system. So we need to lower those risks for business really to enter into this market. Mm. Uh, that's kind of the, the tricky part is convincing people <laughs> that these are different things. Yeah. It depends on 
your motivation and you can make the, di the, the different plants have different commodity ends like I described. Mm -hmm. um, but if you are intentional about it, the farmer should be able to control what he wants the output to be. Yeah. And if you have contracts that say this is going to the textile industry or this is going to this manufacturer, then why are we concerned about the THC level? Yeah, that makes sense. It sounds like as this stuff has made the progress that it's made and continues to make progress, it's really important that people understand like all this stuff because you can't really, if the people, if, if the people that are going to be, um, I don't want to say the ones that are in authority, um, if they can't really understand the value of this and understand the separations and the thing, uh, you know, the different things that we can do, then it's going to be hard to move. It's going to be hard to move forward. I mean, the reality is it's confusing. And, yeah. and even, you know, I'm getting a grasp on it, but mm -hmm. it took me years to fully understand the plant and like what's happening. Yeah. So I, I think we need to, they, they absolutely need to understand, but I, I think we need to make reasonable conclusions and decisions. Like, you know, there, there are going to be risks involved, but what are the risks compared to the reward? And if, if the risk that there might be somebody that grows um, a flower when they said they were supposed to grow a grain or a fiber crop, there's ways we can mitigate that risk and make it very low through inspections. Mm -hmm. And if that the consequences of that risk is the there's an industry that blows up and suddenly our farmers have more money and our local economies have more money. Um, and our, we're constructing like healthier, you know, better environmentally impactful buildings, then maybe it's worth that slight risk. And especially as laws are changing and becoming more open, it's like, is it, it, it lowers the risk again, because then, you know, as people become better about the cannabinoid side, the, the truth is that, you know, the, the best cannabinoids will probably in the end be grown indoors, you know, be in a controlled environment. Mm -hmm. And that's where you'll be able to tweak things in. And what we're talking about will take thousands and thousands of acres. Like we're talking about big commodity crop here when we talk about the fiber, the grain and the building industries. Yeah. So, um, so, so two things here. Yeah. Um, one is, Look, man, everything we do has risks. It looks like we just got to point out to them, as you're saying, it, it, the, w the benefits of this, um, just like every decision we make, it's a cost-benefit analysis. Like, the benefits are going to way outweigh, way outweigh the risks. Um, the other thing I want to ask you is this. In terms of, like, the big-time planning and, and all that stuff in the, within the U.S., where's the where do you, what do you think are the best... Um, places for this stuff to where do you see it sort of being predominantly grown so this is an interesting one I, i've traveled around the country um in the last you know six months especially i went out to like north dakota and saw the north dakota and the northern north dakota south dakota minnesota had that conversation went out to california had that kind of conversation of course we're in the southeast and environmentally it makes sense for different places to grow different things like for instance grain the ideal situation for a grain is you have a dry environment because what most people do is store it in a silo and you do that in North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota, that is fine. You can have a giant field, you can store it in a silo, their environmental conditions, that grain is going to be great and you know, you can process it as needed. You try to do that in our region, in the Southeast, it'll probably mold up mm -hmm. because we have a moist, high humidity environment. Uh. And so it makes most sense in our region to either be growing for cannabinoids or to be growing for fiber. And the reason it's really good for fiber in the Southeast is we have a textile infrastructure and that was where it makes sense to go. North Carolina right now seems to be the best example of this. They are moving things forward more than any state I've seen so far in the textile area. A lot of it has to do with a couple people. Um, there's this guy that seems to know, uh, I don't know. The most I run into about this is like Guy Carpenter, mm -hmm. uh, who's out of North Carolina. And, you know, he talks about like his ideal version. Like I talked about how plants grow. Mm -hmm. His, his ideal crop is like a pencil 
like thin stalk and about eight to 10 feet high. Now these plants can grow up to like 20 feet and their stalks can be like, you know, a couple inches round. And you, when you're talking about processing fiber in general, you want as uniform a stalk as possible. But what he's kind of describing is this plant being like a grass, you know, like, you know, very flexible, flimsy, and that would make more, more sense. You'd have more elasticity in your fibers that are pulled and um, you'd have, you pull it at a low maturity level, like when it's like eight to 10 feet high, like probably, you know, a good week or two before it flowers. Yeah. And it's like, okay, all these things make sense why it works. And he's just the professional that's seen it happen and gone, that's what I need. Gotcha. Yeah. What's his name again? Guy Carpenter. Guy Carpenter. And, and what, I'm sorry, what exactly, what's his, what is he? So he is, um, he deals with hemp on the fiber and the textile range. Oh, gotcha. And okay. he's done like a lot of research and yeah. produced products. Um, he's, he's in North Carolina. Like I said, like that seems to be the biggest thing. And yeah. I don't know if it's because he's there or that's a coincidence. And I will say it seems in the world in general that the difference between something happening and something not happening is a doer, is somebody making that. And I don't know if, if it's his influence that's there yeah. or it's just that makes sense with where he's at, but I know he's contributing a great deal. Good deal. And he's, is he from uh, the U S yes. Okay. Yeah. We talked about, um, Sergey. Sergey. Yeah. Sergey. I'm sorry. Sergey Kovalenkov. Yeah. <laughs> Sergey. Um, so, and there's, and there's other folks, um, that are from Europe that are part of your organization. And so, and like I said before in the video that I watched, Sergey was saying that he's been all around the world doing this. I'm sure that's been very helpful to have, those people uh, within the organization to sort of get this get this moving so absolutely we're not we're not inventing anything really here yeah. we're just doing what they they learned over 30 years yeah. so we actually have a great advantage in this industry compared to other like nascent industries in the fact that we have a perfect example of people that have tried things and some of them succeeded and some of them failed and if we work with them we can learn from their mistakes and make things a lot better uh, for instance, when we did these building codes, we had people from seven countries that looked over the codes and gave us feedback. So that is the kind of international touch that we're trying to work with. Like Australia's way ahead of us, Canada's way ahead of us, Europe's way ahead of us. And all that has to do with the legality of hemp and when it was legal there. Gotcha. And so learning from them and then seeing like what's happening right now in our market is people are trying to enter from these other countries and these other areas into our market because they see what a ripe market it is. Yeah. And, you know, we're able to learn from them and most likely the first generation, a lot of the first generation products we see in this country will actually be reproductions of products from other countries Yeah. until we get our R&D up and then, then we'll make the best stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Heck yeah. Well, man, Jake, this has been, this has been awesome outside of our stupid little break. <laughs> That's all right, man. Um, but, uh, yeah. Okay. So for you guys, um, I hope you've enjoyed this episode. It's, uh, it's, it's been a lot of fun, very insightful for me. Um, like I said before, you guys can go out and donate. Um, strongly encourage you to do that. Strongly encourage you guys to go and visit, uh, the ushba.org website, um, and, and learn as much as you can about this. It's, it's, it's coming guys. Um, and it's really, it's, it's powerful. It's interesting stuff. Uh, it's going to have an impact on us, a positive impact on us. And Jake, I really appreciate you coming and talking to us, man. It's been a lot of fun. Is there anything else you want to say to the audience before we sign off for the day or what? Um, no, uh, well, I, yes, why not? Yeah. I mean, I <laughs> guess <laughs> in general, um, you know, please, please consider joining the USHBA. You know, we're, we're moving this thing forward and we're growing a really good solid team um, we're, we're trying to establish, you know, the, the proper management and leadership and, uh, you know, you can learn all the ins and outs and yeah, please donate to the USHBF, US Hemp Building Foundation. We have uh, about like nine different ideas on things we need to move forward right now. And honestly, it's, it's adapting every day as we accomplish new steps. Uh, so please support us if you can, uh, hemp building is coming. And uh, it's, it's exciting. And we want it in Tennessee. We want it in the U.S. We want it everywhere. So, yeah. Heck yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks, brother. Thank you, Ryan.